him 382 be, 382 be thou my vision and we'll sing the first and the last verse 382 very much. Sure to appreciate you. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And let's notice together these first three verses actually. Philippians chapter 3 beginning with verse 1. Finally my brethren Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And how about this next verse? Are you ready? Here's one to give up the memory. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concession. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Again, Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you tonight, even as we continue through this wonderful letter, this letter to the Philippians that... You have so chosen to record this in this canon of Scripture that we call the Bible, and this is for our learning. This is for us tonight, Lord. And so we'd pray, Lord, that with uh, fresh oil, fresh eyes, and a fresh spirit, that we would just listen carefully to what you have for each and every one of us. We pray in Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Philippians chapter 3, notice again verse 3, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. May I say that? You ought to take home with you tonight. Let's not have any confidence in the flesh. Amen? Throughout history, many religious groups have been convinced that they were the true worshipers of God. Jews think that they worship the one true God correctly. Christians, of course, are convinced that they worship God aright. And among Christians, there are many denominations. Now, you and I have both had this argument or this discussion with people. Each is certain that its approach to God is right. Have you ever had that happen? Of course you have. If you've been saved for more than just a little while and you've ever shared the gospel, often that default response is, well, you know, there are just so many different religions out there. And even among those who call themselves Christians, there are so many different denominations. How am I supposed to know which one's right? 
Non-believers must have a difficult time determining whom to follow. That's why we need to remember that when we're sharing the gospel, we need to stick to the Word of God. Amen? We need to stick to the Bible for sure. Because we need to never forget that we're in a teaching position. I mean, for those who are out there, they ask this question, who's right? Uh, the ones who worship according to liturgy, lit, lit, liturgical uh, type worship, or according to the move of the Spirit, the ones who hold out a strict morality, or, or those who say that one's personal conduct makes no difference whatsoever. Those who say that the Bible alone tells of salvation and God's standard for those who say the Bible must be supplemented by tradition and it's subject to one's own interpretation. I mean, what is the standard for determining who the true believers are? You know, even as I prepared for this, I thought... I am very careful not to be part of that crowd who's always looking for a reason to say that person's probably not saved. I just don't, I, first of all, that's a, that's a quick knee-jerk reaction whenever somebody doesn't maybe say something exactly the way you think they ought to say it. Can I say emphatically, you're saved by recognizing you're a sinner in need of a Savior and trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's how you get saved. Guess what? It cannot be reversed. It's instantaneous. People ask, are you one of those born-againers? I sure am. Ye must be born again, according to John chapter 3, right? And when people ask, are you one of those once saved, always saved? I say, yes, I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. But some of the questions that I'm posing are questions that we all hear. And I would imagine that on a Wednesday night, a crowd like this is pretty solid, pretty sure about where they stand because they stand with what the Bible says. And the Bible tells us who a Christian is. The early church had a similar problem to what we have even 2,000 years later. In this section of Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul warned about Judaizers. Circumcision was the distinguishing mark of the men of Israel. True believers also have a distinguishing mark that makes them people of the true circumcision. That's the language that's used here, right? People of God's covenant community. Spiritual circumcision. We don't kick that around too much, but uh, the Lord sure does, doesn't he? And so, notice with me, number one, uh, and again, let me just say this. I am so adamant about this. I, I just got to tell you something. It seems like there are some folks out there who look for every reason in the world to believe that somebody doesn't know the Lord. As a matter of fact, John MacArthur wrote a book, and the title of the book was Hard to Believe. You know, it's not hard to believe. The gospel is simple. But I think what's hard for people to understand is all these extra hoops that people are expected to somehow incorporate. For example, we see extra hoops being added uh, in this case right here. Circumcision, right? Circumcision doesn't make you any more saved than baptism does. But notice with me, true believers have a distinctive worship. That's what I want to break down. What, what I think happens when we trust Christ as Savior. What, what is the Holy Spirit doing in us? Well, believers worship God in the Spirit. That's what the Bible says. Or through the agency of the Holy Spirit. The Jews had been proud of their rituals. And there are sure are a lot of people who call themselves Christians today who are holding to rituals. And hey, let me just say, I am not against doing something a regular, a kind of a regular way. I guess that's what a ritual would be. But if the ritual is not founded in Scripture, 
it has no no foundation, no no basis for continuing in. But when you just do it this way because this is the way they've always done it and you hold more to the ritual than you do to the Bible, you're in big trouble. And so the Jews had been proud of the rituals, but now this was a spiritual approach uh, to the worship of God. We understand and appreciate that as born-again Christians, we need to worship. We need to consider God's worth. We need to count our, I mean, see his blessings, his attributes. We can worship God by the Holy Spirit because God is spirit, according to the Bible. Jesus affirmed this in John chapter 4. Let's turn there. John chapter 4, notice verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. That's pretty emphatic. That's pretty clear, isn't it? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I'll tell you, you really are missing out if you don't appreciate and appropriate the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We can worship God by the Holy Spirit because God is spirit. Jesus is. Speaking to us here makes it clear. Because God is spirit and is not bound, he can be worshipped in truth by the help of the Holy Spirit anywhere, anytime, uh, any place, and in many ways. Now we believe that where two or more gather together in his name, he is here also. Now, we, I always seem like I preface that by saying that scripture has to do with church discipline, but I think it can be applied. And so, true believers have a distinctive worship. May I say, first and foremost, worship needs to be important. Now, worship has been hijacked, the word itself, hasn't it? Because now we have groups that say, well, we have a worship service, and we have a worship leader. Uh, that's because you don't know how to worship. They're, they're the leader. They're going to do that for you. You know, the, the word has nothing to do with, you know, a particular style of music or, or what we do for 45 minutes on a Sunday morning. Worshiping the Lord is something that you and I should be doing 24-7. Amen. Are thankful? Are you thankful that you're saved by a God who's on the throne and in control 24-7? Have you, have you ever had times where you're just reading your Bible and, and you're not just, you know, working your way through some scripture because you're trying to be an obedient Christian, but you're, you're enjoying worship. I mean, just even as uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to you and you're considering God's worth. You see, this was so new to the legalistic crowd and anyone and everyone else who had a different idea of how how we're to approach God. And you look at all of the, the isms and the cults and everything out there today, you look at mainline Christianity. When I say liturgical, I'm talking about those mainline denominations where uh, just uh, some stale um, sermonette that has been, you know, copied and recopied and, sit and, and used over and over again. Um, this idea of, 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 of really worshiping the Lord is, 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 is an entirely different deal. And you see, we believe that when you trust Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit begins to start working in you. Now, I can also say this. A person can get saved and they can be going to a place that doesn't have 
a, a clear understanding of what worship is and maybe they're involved in a, in a group that's not even a Christian church. And we would pray that the Holy Spirit would work in their heart. I can tell you of people that I've led to the Lord and it took a while for them to get out of certain places where they were. They were saved because they recognized that they were a sinner in need of a Savior. You see, we don't, we don't, we're, we're very careful not to get the cart before the horse. Well, you need to start coming to Maranatha and you need to do this and that. Hey, we want them to, hey, listen, if you're, if this is you, where the Lord has you, you believe this is where people ought to be, amen? I've always been concerned about people who say, well, you can just go to any church you want. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think that's a good idea. But I know that the main thing, the first and most important work is believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen? And so a, a true believer, he's growing in his walking relationship and he's, he's, there's a distinctive, uh, I'm talking about a worship of the Lord. Again, we're not talking about a, a particular style or a particular uh, group that, you know, does it a certain way. We're talking about worshiping the Lord. And here's one for you. Newsflash, this, this is especially uh, for all of us independent Baptists. Are you ready? True believers have joy. <laughs> is, is it okay to be happy in the Lord? Amen. True believers have joy. The second phrase of this verse mentions those who rejoice in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you what, I listen to some of these people and I watch some of these people and I'm thinking, where is the joy? <laughs> I mean, really. Joy is one of the distinctive marks of the Christian. And again, the word Christian itself, we know they were called Christians first at Antioch, weren't they? And it was by their example as followers of Jesus Christ. It was actually a derogatory term. And it was one of those terms that stuck. We rejoice in Christ Jesus because of the work he has done in us. Christ has performed a work of grace in our lives that, that makes us new creatures. Aren't you glad that the preacher is a new creature. Amen? Amen? Aren't you glad that you are too? Amen? There is joy in knowing Christ and the life that we have in Him. You know, if nobody's ever interested in having what you got, I think it's fair to ask the question, why not? You know, that's why, I, that's why I think we need to be very careful about our witness and our testimony. I don't want you to fake it, but I want you to talk up the Lord. I want to talk up the Lord. As a matter of fact, you know what happens when the Holy Spirit uh, pricks my heart and I realize I need, to be, I need to be focusing on talking up the Lord? You know what I'm thinking on? The Lord, rather than piddly little old Daryl who needs this or wants that or thinks that or whatever, Right? Can I tell you something? We, <laughs> I mean, think about it. We, as born-again Christians, we have the privilege of, of uh, on this side of eternity, having joy in the fact that we're saved. You know, there are a whole lot of people today who find themselves falling back into circumstantial joy. Well, as long as my bills are being paid, then I'll have joy. As long as my family, you know, uh, is okay. And, and these are all important issues and concerns. We could be talking about, you know, work, sickness, and all the things that we're going to be praying about. But have you ever gotten around people who maybe it seems like when you watch what's going on in their life that, they don't have it as well as you do, but you can't help but want to get around it because they have joy. You know what I mean? I'll tell you, I, I just, there's a whole lot of folks like that right here at Maranatha Baptist Church. I just love hanging out with you because I, I just, the joy of the Lord uh, is 
uh, is, is obvious. You know what? I, I just got to tell you something. I am 100% okay with people seeing the joy of the Lord. And you know, that's something that I think we need to just decide to do on purpose is, is uh, you know, maybe set aside all this busy concentration on our self and our circumstances and just, you know, really go back to a time when you remember, wow, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amen? I'm, I was blind, but now I see. I'm saved. I'm saved. I remember many, many years ago when I was first getting to know folks here at Maranatha and they were getting to know me. They asked me what was the most important thing in my life. What have you accomplished? I said, I love Jesus. Amen. And if you don't accomplish anything other than that, you've done the most important thing. Amen. Joy. Joy. (laughs) I remember having people over the years say things like, you know, one thing about you, Pastor, you actually really believe what you say. <laughs> you actually seem to be happy in the Lord. I got to tell you something. Amen. Amen to that. We rejoice in Jesus Christ because his presence is with us. Jesus makes promises to be with us to the end of the world. Lo, I am with you always. And he always, 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 always makes good on his promises. It really is true. Every single promise is true, and every single promise is for you. The sovereign God is our constant companion. And I got to tell you something, that gives me joy. When everything else is going south and not going the way Daryl Miller thinks things ought to be going, all of a sudden the Lord just gets a hold of me, the Holy Spirit grabs a hold of me and says, what in the world are you going to do? Are you going to sit here and have a pity party or are you going to rejoice in the Lord? And you know, as a pastor, I got to just tell you, Uh, that's a whole lot easier to preach when I'm out of town preaching somewhere and I don't know these people. You know what I mean? When I'm here and I'm at home and I'm with my church family, uh, I am going to preach this same truth. Even when I know you might be going through financial difficulty, even when I know uh, your marriage may not be what it needs to be, even when I know uh, you and I both know we've had our share of hardships, we shall have joy in the Lord. Jesus says that he wants us to have his joy, that our joy may be full. How about that? Not my joy, not your joy, but have his joy. We, thirdly then tonight, recognize that true believers have a definite faith. And you know, this is important, and I've kind of gone over this and some of what we've been doing in Sunday school. When, people, when 85% of, a, of the country says that they're Christian, yet a much, much smaller percentage believe that the Bible's the Word of God and believe uh, that the precepts that are taught in Scripture are applicable, you kind of wonder how definite their faith is, right? Paul spoke of believers as those who have no confidence in the flesh. I just, I think that's powerful. That's, that's, that, I need that all the time. I need to be reminded. Every time I start trusting the flesh is when I get myself in big, big trouble. No confidence in the flesh. Flesh here is, is synonymous with self. (laughs) No, you know what? I'm a whole lot better off when I have no confidence in Daryl Miller. Amen? You say, well, that's easy, brother. I don't have any confidence in Daryl Miller either. (laughs) But you know what? We're to have confidence in the Lord. Amen? Our confidence is in Him. God's people have a confidence that is not rooted in themselves, but in Him. In Him. In Him. The faith that we have for salvation 
rest in Jesus Christ and Him alone. You know, I'm not trusting, you didn't trust, and you're not trusting any, any group. You're trusting Jesus Christ for your salvation. Amen? You know, it's easy for us to look at someone else and we can see where they're coming up short, where they're struggling, and we can, and in our flesh, it's so easy for us to point out what's wrong with everybody else. But even after you come to know Christ as your Savior, we all have our own failures and our own sins. Isn't it amazing how often it'll be after we get to know each other a little bit better and we're actually doing more than what most Christians do, and that's, are you ready, coming to church and serving, that we become familiar, and then we've got to be careful not to be now suddenly, you know, having opinions about our brethren when we are treating somebody else who doesn't even show up for church like they're the greatest thing in the whole wide world. You see, the problem that we have is, is when we, when we recognize God's standard and when we recognize who we're supposed to be as Christians, it's easy for us to get our eyes off of ourselves. Matter of fact, that's just a coping mechanism, isn't it? And say, well, you know what? I don't want to pay too much attention to where I'm coming up short and where my problems lie, but you know what? You know, brother such and such, you know, and we, and we use this, you know, this church language. We need to pray for, for them. You know, they're just not consistent and they're this and that. You know what? I got enough to do just to be thinking where I need to be improving in these areas. And, and, and I got to tell you, nobody should ever be happy about somebody struggling, thinking that this somehow makes them look better. Well, you know what? I have my share of problems, but I'm sure I'm messing up as bad as such and such is. And you know what? Well, some of, sometimes I even see this happen among, you know, churches. I know, I, 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 over, can I just tell you something that breaks my heart is to watch feuding going on among, I'm talking about Bible-believing Christians. I mean, it's just, I'm so, I'm so burned out on it and tired of it. It's, to me, it's the worst, absolutely the worst way that the internet can be used. I got nothing to do but just talk about what's wrong with this other guy all day long. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, my Bible says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And I need to, I need to, I need to focus on, on God's grace and, and allowing Him to have His way in my life so that I might be able to encourage and help somebody else. I just got to tell you, be careful about finding yourself uh, turning into some kind of a couch computer Christian, I, I'm all for good, solid preaching, and I hope whatever you're listening to, uh, you feel edified and encouraged. But if all of it, if, if it's just about a bunch of stuff where somebody's arguing about somebody else, uh, you know what? Maybe, I don't know, open up your Bible and read it, you know? True believers have a definite faith. Today, you and I, as born-again Christians, we have for us, we hold in our hot little hands the Word of God. Amen? We have right here everything that we need to be the men and women of God that God wants us to be. Our desire is not to please some group or some circle or some whatever it's to be who the Lord wants us to be. Can I tell you something? There is a big difference between people out there who are just religious and people who have trusted Christ as their Savior. But there are many that have trusted Christ as their Savior and they're struggling. They're kind of coming up against a wall because 
they're not placing their, their focus on the Lord first and foremost, not some man, not any, any group, but the Lord and allowing the Holy Spirit to work as he or she studies the Word of God. That's why the title tonight might be a little bit, you know, deceptive because we're not fruit inspectors around here. We're not going to be running around looking for a reason to... Uh, convince ourselves that this guy over here probably isn't saved because you know what he 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 likes such and such or he doesn't like such and such or or they went to that college or they even don't they 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 went to college and that's wrong or whatever you know it gets pretty crazy after a while aren't you glad that you're saved today aren't you glad that because Jesus Christ loves you so much that he's made a way for you you have that confidence today don't we, I mean, don't we have the greatest message of all to share with a world that needs to hear some good news? Amen? Amen. Father, we do thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you for your word. And Lord, even help us even as we continue to grow in our walk and relationship with you to, to, to keep, as we have read here, uh, our focus on being Men and women of God who worship you in spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ. And we have no confidence in the flesh. Our focus is on you and in you, Lord. Have your way, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.